The evidence is going to show that then Mr. Masters uh, responds very abruptly uh, using obscenities, uh, shouting many uh, 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 obscenities. Now, before I go any further, let me just say this, because right now I think I have painted, I'm, I'm, I hope that I've painted a picture of these individuals in the middle of, of, of the intersection of 4th and M Street, uh, two in a car, and uh, one is uh, <clears throat> illegally crossing the street, if you will. The evidence is going to show that um, And it's important to note that these are detectives. And as detectives, they were undercover. So the vehicle that they were operating was an unmarked vehicle. They were also operating in plain clothes. But the evidence is also going to show that Detective Browning, who was a passenger in this cruiser, had his credentials in front of him. And we're going to show you some photographs showing his credentials. And the obvious credential is the fact that he had a badge that was in front of him. The evidence is further going to show that at some point there was some resting on the side of Detective Casey's car and the car that the uh, detectives were in. They pull off to the side. But unsatisfied, the evidence is going to show that Mr. Masters then approaches that vehicle approaches that vehicle very upset um, and very angry, still shouting obscenities. At that time, the testimony, you're going to hear testimony that Detective Casey identified himself as a police officer because he, his, his, his most of his identification was in the garments that were, were, were under the garments that he was wearing. Okay, his badge, his, his badge was on the outside, but not readily visible. I don't think there's going to be any dispute of that. Police was, was uh, uh, on a T-shirt uh, uh, under another layer of clothing. The, testimony, the evidence is going to show that Mr. Masters then approaches this vehicle very angry, very upset, and while Detective Case is shouting, police, police, Mr. Masters, this defendant, begins to strike Detective Case uh, in what we believe to be an unprovoked minor. We believe the evidence is going to uh, show that. Um, Detective Case does what any law enforcement officer would do, would employ uh, his training to protect himself. Uh, he didn't pull his gun, didn't do anything like that, just simply protected himself as this defendant was attacking him. And while that is going on, the, the uh, uh, Detective Browning then gets out of the vehicle, again, clearly indicating police, 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 and Mr. Masters refuses to retreat. Detective Browning and Detective Case eventually subdue the defendant, call for a commanding officer, and then thereafter call for an EMS. Um, and the evidence is going to show you that, uh, that uh, the defendant suffered a broken nose as a result of this simply because you're going to see that there was no way from the evidence that we're going to show that these detectives could subdue Mr. Masters uh, until he was actually struck in the face by one of the uh, detectives. You're going to hear testimony and evidence about a number of statements from these detectives that uh, this defendant made while there uh, in an apologetic manner. One statement that this defendant made that you're going to hear uh, uh, in the form of evidence is uh, uh, 
while I guess why, if you will, he was so upset and how bad his day has been. You're going to hear testimony that he mentioned to these detectives that he felt like that uh, his girlfriend had uh, started dating someone else and he just simply wasn't having a good day. But the evidence is going to show you that he refused to retreat uh, after these detectives identified themselves uh, um, as police officers. And after he's taken to the hospital, uh, he's charged with uh, menacing, disorderly conduct in the second degree and resistant arrest. The evidence is also going to, to, to reveal all the elements of those crimes that I've just indicated. Uh, Detective uh, Case, in his, t in, 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 in his evidence, is going to express uh, how he was, it, it, he reasonably apprehended that he was going to be physically harmed by Mr. Masters based on the fact that Mr. Masters just simply was not retreating when he heard the sound of police, police, police. And so at the end of this case, I'm going to come back up here because there's only two opportunities that we get the opportunity to talk directly to each of you. And that's here during the opening, or what I refer to as the introduction, and then at the end in the closing, or what I refer to as the conclusion. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to find Mr. Masters guilty of uh, uh, menacing, resisting arrest, and disorderly conduct. Thank you. All right. Is it Mr. Stegman, this is going to be you? You, Mr. Shore? Who's that? All right, Mr. Shore. Jonathan Masters was protecting himself that day, and unfortunately for him, he didn't do a very good job. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a case about an incident that took place the night of December 7, 2012, this past year. It happened in a neighborhood near the University of Louisville at 4th and M Street. This case is about what happened while John was walking from his house to a neighborhood gas station to get some food and drinks. Around 6 that night, John left. The gas station was about a five minute walk from his home. He took a right from his house. He walked up to 4th Street. He took a right down 4th Street and walked down 4th Street until he approached M. When he got to M Street, he crossed. When he got to the other side of M Street, he checked the traffic in the intersection. He didn't see any cars coming left or right, but he saw one white car sitting across from him with no turn signals on. Again, he checked traffic. The car wasn't moving. It didn't have a signal to indicate that it was going to turn left or right. So he crossed the intersection. When he crossed, this white car pulled a sudden U-turn, came up behind him, and nearly hit him. Someone in the car yelled some profanities at him. Although it might not have been a smart idea, he yelled some profanities back. After that, the car pulled directly in front of him, blocking his path. John will tell you that it looked like the driver was in the middle of a road rage fit. John will tell you that the driver of the car stepped out in front of him and towards him. John will also tell you that he was afraid of what the passengers were about to do to him. And so he swung out at the driver when he stepped out towards him. After the first swing, there was a struggle between John and the car driver. Soon enough, the passenger also came in. After some length of time, the passenger identified himself as a police officer. When this happened, when he heard this, he gave up and surrendered. During this incident, John was trying to protect himself from people he thought were out there to hurt him. This left John in the hospital with a broken nose. Those officers are here in court today to tell you what John did was a crime. 
The evidence you're about to hear will show you that John didn't commit any crimes that night. The only thing he did was protect himself from two strangers that he thought were in the middle of a road rage fit. We anticipate the Commonwealth will call Detectives Cass, Case and Browning to testify. We expect they'll tell you that they immediately identified themselves as police officers. They'll tell you that they did nothing wrong. They'll tell you that they didn't I already said that. But listen carefully to their testimony and ask yourselves if the story that they're presenting to you really adds up. Be ready to ask yourselves if it really seemed like John went out looking to get in a fight with two police officers. It just doesn't make sense. Once you hear all the evidence and instructions of law from the judge, my co-counsel, Ian Stegmaier, will come back in front of you and ask that you find John not guilty. What? Mr. Price, you have a witness? Everybody good? And again, anytime y'all want to break, raise your hand, right? So I'm going to presume you're good until, you know, you raise your hand. You have a witness, Mr. Price? Yes, Your Honor, we do. <clears throat> Your Honor, the Commonwealth calls as its first witness, uh, Detective Joel Case. Come on up. I need you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to testify truthfully to the course of this trial? Yes, sir. I need you to have a seat here and speak loudly. Just a second, Your Honor, please. <clears throat> Your Honor, if it pleases the court, is oh, this uh, okay? Fine. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Detective Case, for the record, would you state your full name, please? Detective Joel Cassie. Okay. And, uh, and I know I call you Case. That's I apologize for that. Uh, uh, Detective Cassie, uh, where are you employed, sir? Louisville Metro Police Department. And how long have you been employed with Louisville Metro Police Department? This November will be five years. Okay. And are you assigned to a particular division at the, uni at the uh, Louisville Metro Police Department? I am assigned to the Louisville Metro Police Department's Fiber Unit. Okay, and what does that entail, sir? It is uh, designed for violent crime. Okay. It's uh, we seek violent offenders. Okay, and uh, have you always been assigned to to the Viper unit? Prior to Viper, I worked in the Fourth Division, which starts on Broadway. It entails Old Louisville, Smoke Town, Churchill Downs area. That's where I spent probably three and a half years prior to the Viper unit. Okay. And would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, just briefly uh, some background of your training as a police officer, if there's a, and particularly if there's any, a train, any extraordinary training that you've had as, a, as an officer since you've been with the Louisville Metro Police Department? Uh, upon joining the police department, we went through 32 weeks of the police academy, which was held here in Louisville. Uh, we had several different training, including case law, uh, our standard KRS, which is the statutes that we're following today. Uh, I've also had, since then, SWAT training. I've had several different types of training. Basically, we continue to train once we're on the police department. We continue to train yearly. Did you have any previous law enforcement experience? I did not. Detective for a case? Okay. And I'm not sure if I've asked this question, but let me, uh, there's only one way to find out is to ask it again if I have. And that is, uh, do you, uh, uh, well, I forgot what that was. Okay. So, um, 
let, let, let me just take you uh, specifically to December 7, 2012. Do you recall December 7, 2012? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Do you recall encountering an individual uh, by the name of Jonathan Masters? Yes, sir. And do you see him here in the courtroom today, sir? Yes, sir. Can, yes. Can you identify him for the ladies and gentlemen of the